don't have the app, if you want a uh, paper survey, let me know at the end of the session and I'll give you a, a paper form that you can see the survey. It's very important for us and I'm sure for Paul as well. Yeah, thank you. So I think uh, that's all I want to, all the house uh, keeping on with, so I'm okay. just going to turn it over to uh, Paul Buffington, the Principal Enterprise Solution Engineer with Atlassian. So thank you, Charlie. You appreciate it. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. Almost good afternoon, right? Almost lunchtime. So, uh, Good to be with you all. It's been a great conference so far. I actually have enjoyed many of the conversations. Uh, it's been a few years since I've been to Pink, and I'm so excited about some of the innovation and just the, the change in direction and the thinking. And so uh, I come from 15 years of consulting in the IT space, IT service management, and some Splunk in there as well. And so I, I love working with customers, hearing their stories, sol solving challenges, and about year and a half, almost two years ago now, I joined Atlassian and they had an opportunity to focus on all things <coughs> IT. And it's been an exciting journey, uh, especially to, to step in an organization that is focused on uh, the way the teams work. And I'll talk about that and I'll introduce you to what Atlassian is. And my goal for this session is to give you something to take away, because many of you are probably are somewhere on the path of your DevOps journey, you're hearing a lot about it. Some are just getting started and learning, you have other teams you're trying to uh, synchronize with and so and, and connect and be more efficient and effective in the way that you deliver services to your customers. And so what I want to do is give you some insights that you take away. Whether you use the Elastium products or not, and I'm, I'm kind of curious, how many have Elastium products somewhere in their organization? I, I figured that would be the case. Okay, great. You may not use them directly, it might be other, you might be IT and your team uses them somewhere else. What I want to talk about is some ideas that you can take back and apply. Atlassian is very much a unique culture in that we like to share with our customers and share these innovations. And so that's my whole goal today. I want to give you some where you can go and learn more about this. This is going to be a 30,000 foot, maybe 15,000 foot tour. I'm going back to my Coast Guard days in the back of a helicopter. but. I always like to use that analogy. I'm going to give you a good overview of some ideas, and then what we've done is we have a, a whole microsite that's all around thought leadership and sharing information for the IT organization, IT community. Um, so I'll, I'll point you to that at the end here. So what's the agenda today? I'm going to just go through a brief introduction of who is Alassian, which I'll get to. Let me jump forward, sorry. Who is Alassian? What is DevOps? I'm sure you've heard this a lot, so I'll move through this section quickly, but I think there's a couple key points that I want to emphasize there. And also, how do I, because culture is so much a part of that, how do I develop that culture? And it starts within very small teams, within IT teams. I'm going to give you some ideas on how to do that. And then we'll turn our focus to service management at Atlassian. What does that mean to us? How do we deliver that? And then how does DevOps factor into that? How are teams aligned? And I'll give you some insights into that. And then once I've talked about our approach to I picked, it was hard to pick. I had like five different ones I could talk about use cases. I picked two. One is external focused for customer support because so much of IT is involved in that and they don't align it as well with dev. And the other part of that is incident response. It is at the core of what a team has to get right every time and there's always room for improvement and I've, I've got some insights in the way that our teams operate globally. And then learn more resources. And there are so many fantastic resources that our teams have written in eBooks. Uh, webinars that have been recorded that Alassian is sharing is here's how we're doing it, take and apply it and learn from it and obviously grow from there. And then obviously it's time for Q&A. So, um, and I am, I'm in the enterprise team. I started out in product marketing and moved back into a role that's more of a solution engineer. So I work with some of our larger enterprise customers, uh, folks on how they can solve their IT challenges in using the Alassian tools. So Alassian is a global company. We've been around 13 years. Uh, about 60,000 customers, I think that number's uh, above there, that, that's uh, what I saw last in the statistics. So it's a large customer base across all of the different industries. And the way that we're distributed is we have about 250 support agents that support customers around the globe in about eight different locations there. And IT staff for this large organization is about 80 people and growing. We're growing at a very fast rate. We're approximately, I think we're beyond this right now, but around 1,700 people. So it's, it's a growth rate to match the demand and the deployment of products. And I'll talk about what we have for our products just to kind of give you an idea. But the mission, and I love this, really resonate with me, maybe from my Coast Guard background and just what I've done over the years is, Lassian's mission knows that behind every great accomplishment is not an individual, but a team. And that team needs the right capability from process 
and technology and the way they interact to be able to accomplish those things, great things. And we've told many stories. I love hearing these stories and the way that customers use our products. And so that's, that's our mission. And one of the things, especially lately, is we're focused on how do we take dev operations and even cu customer-focused teams, and it might be IT that could be customer support, and make them more efficient in the way that they work. You think about the way that these teams actually need to collaborate and share information, and there's so many walls that actually are, that are just built between these and just happen in, a, in an organization. So how do we tear down these barriers to where they can be more efficient in the way that they operate? And so that's what I'm going to talk about, focusing on all three of these aspects. Now, I will highlight some of the tools we have. We use our own applications and tools inside. We also have a lot of others that we've added. But the awesome thing I think I like is that we give autonomy to our team. What tools do you need to accomplish in your day-to-day -day jobs to be effective? And so they're always looking at it. But our products are built around that. We interact very closely with our customers. And so probably a lot of you are familiar with JIRA and tracking issues. JIRA Service Desk was a product that evolved out of, we, we surveyed our customers and we found 30% are using it for IT. So out of a ship it, and I'll talk about what a ship it is in a few minutes, we shipped the first version of JIRA Service Desk that has grown up now to be uh, ITIL certified product in that. We have dev tools, we have ways that teams can collaborate. So every product we build is focused on those teams. So I just want to kind of highlight how these teams interact. But I'll go back to DevOps. You know, for those of you that are probably starting your journey, you're, you're soaking in a lot of information this week on what is DevOps? I, I know it's important, so how do I take my IT organization and start to meld those practices with the way that I have my IT service management practices, ITIL processes? And at the end of the day, and I love Gene Kim, I've spent some time with him recently when we were in Atlanta, and I, I love that he is a big proponent of ITIL. In fact, he's working with the Axos teams in, in some certification and enablement, and he's published two fantastic books. If you ever read The Phoenix Project or The DevOps Handbook, I highly recommend taking the time to go through those because it really gives you the framework um, of how this all fits together. But at the end of the day, if I were to summarize, I would say it's about communication, collaboration, and automation. And at the very heart of that, to make this effective, is culture. And this is what I'm starting to see is that IT teams are figuring out how can our culture start to evolve in a way that they can better align with this. Now, to make this journey, you've heard this a lot this week, we need to be informed and learn from those out there. And a couple of things, and you saw this early in the keynote, I love the stats in the keynote, um, for where, where they predicted and where we are today and what's coming, and also the Puppet Labs. They do an annual report every year surveying all this. You probably, if you haven't downloaded it to go through it, I highly recommend that. Um, you saw these stats earlier. Teams that adopt this, and that's both development and IT operations working closely together, are much more effective and have a direct impact on the business. Now, here's the awesome thing. This is not just for the unicorns of the world, the Amazons, the Googles. This is for a major bank, ING. I, I heard them speak last year in London um, at the DevOps conference. I saw their streaming, but then I talked to the team, and they talked about how their change management process evolved. And this is a large corporate bank out of Europe, and they evolved in the way that they deliver services. And it's something that happens over time. They learn from those lessons. But inside of this report is a great insights. Go back through and read the 2015 and the 2016. Uh, Jez Humble, um, forgetting who else. Oh, Nicole uh, Ferguson. I uh, met her down at the ITSM conference in Australia. Fantastic people that are passionate about learning and sharing those insights. So that's one resource. The other one out there is, well, what's the state of IT today? HDI did a phenomenal report. And by the way, this is not in the deck to download. I'm uploading this to them today. This was one that was missed in the editing, and I wanted to get this in. HDI, and we, we work with HDI on this. We wanted to survey, where is it at? So I think 65% of customers have DevOps in some form. But we want to know where is IT today. This report is fantastic because it breaks it down by capability. But as you can see here, you know, 74% are frustrated in the way that they're actually involved in the development process. Um, you know, tools, you know, they can open and close doors that you can see, but the visibility at the end of the day was really big. So he, again, this is really kind of a great measure. Where's my organization today? How do I align with these stats? And it gives you that insight to say, here's where we're at, here's potentially where we can start to move the needle. Now, Dev, DevOps is definitely a movement. It's, as I said, it's about a lot of those things, automation, the way that we ship code faster. But IT is so much a key part of this in being successful. 
I've come across some DevOps teams that are very much focused on the automation, but the continuous feedback coming back to them, it's, it's not as, it's deficient. So what I want to focus on is, in the use cases here, how can we bring IT into some of these parts of the stories in the operationals, uh, incident management, as well as the feedback loop. Now, what we've found through surveying our customers, about 63% on some level are practicing, they have DevOps implemented. How well IT is aligned, that whether it's a part of the HDI we're learning, it just depends on the size of the organization. But what we have found in both in Atlassian is that we need to focus on creating a culture around that. Last year, we worked with John Custy, and many of you may follow him. I love following him on um, Twitter. He's got great insights, ITSM Ninja. John, he worked with us to write an ebook around this. And this really is not, he put this together, he's been thinking about how ITSM fits with the DevOps uh, movement and complementing one another, working together, because ITSM will be much more the framework and the process for that. And he looked at what is needed to move the needle to, for my organization to start to move in this direction. And it starts in smaller teams. Now, if you have executive buy-in to help you in that, fantastic. But the areas and comms, and this comes out of a 2010 DevOps conference, uh, John Willis, Damien Edwards were the two authors on it. If you Google this, you'll find it. But comms is about first culture. What is my culture today within my team, and what could I possibly start to build and build into that? I'll give you an example within just my own team. I'm, I'm a solution engineering team. I, I don't function in Agile on a day-to-day -day basis. I do interact with the engineers because some of the feedback we provide. I just went through some Agile training. It was phenomenal because it really opened up my eyes to even further. I mean, I'm working a lot, so I've learned a lot. But just to do that deep dive within our team, it made our product feedback process within the enterprise team that what we gather from our enterprise customers even more effective in the way that we're going to streamline what we're giving back to the team. And we've changed the way that we operate. So it's a great way just to measure your culture. Um, I'll talk about some resources that also are available. Automation, it talks about where do you start with automation. Uh, dev teams are really focused on this, but where does IT fit into this in the releases, the change management process? Lean is another important aspect. How do we take our current processes and revisit them to apply lean to them? Measurement and sharing. I, w I have a, there's a whole webinar on this, plus the ebook that John published. At the very end, I'll show you where you can find the ebook to download, and you can also watch the webinar. This is a great place to start thinking about how I build that culture within my IT operations teams and then expand that across my IT organization. Okay, so now to the use cases of Atlassian. First of all, just 24 uh, support, multiple geos, follow the sun, all of those that factor into it. Process consistencies across, across very different teams in the way they're working, infrastructure, languages, all of this goes into it. So how do we tackle this? And on day one with Mike and Scott, this was top of mind to be able to deliver amazing service. And Mike Cannon Brooks actually had a webinar last year uh, that delivered on, he talked about how we, we do this and he used an airplane analogy. It was fa fantastic, going from the Wright brothers to building a plane in flight. But this is what I wanna talk about. And what at the very heart of Atlassian is the culture. So we're focused on, um, Culture, what do I mean by that? Gardner had a great quote, fostering culture isn't, uh, innovation isn't about ping pong and free beer, okay? Um, it is focus on finding common core values that you bring people around and rally them around. And our values are published like open company, uh, you no know, bullshit, play as a team, build with heart and balance, don't mess, the, you know, don't uh, um, bleep the customer, I won't say the, uh, the actual part of that on, of this, but here, but these are values that are at the core of the way that we interact with those. And everyone has different ones that are favorite, like build heart and balance, or play as a team. And it's that is very infused in the way that people think about going forward. So if you're cross-functional in the team, I'm working with a dev team, or I'm working with a design team. It's very much at the heart of it. It's also be radically transparent. It's one thing I love about Atlassian. It is an open company. And that really helps in the communication. It you know, starts in the small teams, but it's across the organization. So we, we um, hire people around those values. But here's the other part is that they culture innovation with what we call ship -its. And we have actually published this. We just had a large corporation come in and study how Atlassian does ship -its. Every quarter we dedicate 48 hours that a team can go in and work. And some of my colleagues I'm here with today, we worked with some developers to ship a capability for one of our products. Others focus on capability within the team. But you work within this small amount, it's competitive, you get a chance to present, and at the end of the day, it's the bragging rights that you won global ship it. 
but the innovation that came out came out. Our, our service desk product came out of the need we saw. A team went away and built the initial prototype for that and shipped it and ultimately released that to the customers. We have a whole setup of how you, you could start with just in your own team where you dedicate a certain amount of time to that innovation. Taking IT people or across to other teams and drive that innovation that helps build your culture and also gets you kind of streamlined towards the approach you want to take with better working across those teams. Now, the last one I want to mention before this is, this is available. Um, the Alassian Team Playbook. As I said, teams are really important. This is outside of technology, outside of process. Don Price is quite a character. You may have seen him in some of our videos. You see him in a Darth Vader suit or a, a, a no, Stormtrooper suit or Willy Wonka, but he's one of our thought leaders and a, just a great evangelist for Alassian on our culture, but he saw a need, let's publish a team playbook. So that way you could do a health check for your internal per, a team. I just did it recently with my team. You go through and you all answer questions and then you go back and you evaluate where are we at in this question is the way that we function. It's a way that you can do that introspective and improve as a team. These are the types of things that Alaska is very passionate about improving the way teams operate and that's available. You can download, get a hold of the team playbook and apply it. And I think you'll find it's really useful. Okay, so that's hopefully give you an idea on the culture if you didn't know much about Alassian. What I want to show you is a couple of use cases. I picked two today. Customer support and IT operations. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our model. Our model is very a top-down. We, we don't have any, we don't have a dedicated sales team. We actually invest more in product than we, in, I think, some of the other organizations. They spend more on uh, external bound than that. We want to invest more in the product. We want to make it easy for customers to find out about our product. And so they, they come to the website, they find out about it. And so at the very part of this is a way to, what are the top drivers, what are the th ways that we can fix ourselves as customers use our product? So I'll talk about that. Internally is we want to have help customers find answers. Uh, knowledge is power. Knowledge-centric support is so key today. And so how can we make that to sh a shift to the one, to the millions that need that information and create an engaging community. If you've been on Elastic Answers, if you, if you have an Elastic product where you talk to your teams that use it, they love it because of the community and supporting itself. And then finally, just being able to serve and, and augment the automation to support. I'm going to have a couple examples across all of this. Now, what often happens in an organization, you have product management, you have developers somewhere off in the organization, they build and ship product, and then support comes in and it's up to them to figure out how to support the product. And they might do some enablement but there's definitely a disconnect between these two teams. In fact, according to HDI, a study that was last year, 99% of those teams felt that they were unprepared for releases and only 23% of them have a, a process in place to support teams uh, to enable a new release. And whether you release you know, product externally or it's a service, maybe it's not in a directly a software, but it's a service, and they need to support it, they need to be enabled. And, and last year, knew this was a challenge very early on, so they shifted, and then we experiment over time. We learn from that. We, we're not, a, one thing I love about it is a couple of, or a lot of the leadership team, we're not afraid to fail because we'll learn from those failures, and there's been some failures, and then we go back and we improve upon it because there's a lot of introspective that goes on. And so what we've done is we've actually put in place is the Alassian set team, the service enablement team. And their person, purpose exists to create, a, obviously, a frictionless experience for customers, and they want to um, be able to look at where those friction points are and feed that back to the development team. So what they've done in this is that across all the support <coughs> centers, they understand the channel, the way the customers are using the product. What are the top things they actually have? They feed this into their own service desk. They now analyze, and there's a whole uh, acronym in the way that they go through, and they, is this UX, is this, uh, is this actually a, a bug or an issue, and they start to filter this up, and this is directly going back to the development team. Two of the members spoke at our Alassian Summit this last year, and I just learned so much in the way that they operate. Um, it, it, they've actually published that up. If you go to the Alassian Summit site, they've had their video up, and I think there's even been a blog published about that if you look um, Alassian um, Service Enablement Team. But they offer valuable insights you could take back and apply in the method that they use within your customer support organization and the way they work. What happens here, and here's the areas that they operate. So they understand what are the top issues and support issues. Just make sure the animations are working. Um, they're able to go through that. They have a top uh, story, a top monthly report that they're feeding back to the engineering team. Product managers read these reports. 
They publish them in a way in, in Confluence to it's interactive, they can ask questions. So it's a, not just a throw a report over the wall, it's very interactive. Why is this? Can you give me more data on this? And they can drill into this. So it becomes a very valuable feedback point in the development team because they may have shipped this feature a while ago and they're now seeing this, what can they do to adjust? And when uh, the two uh, engineers that work in this team, they go through a use case. This is the way the product was today. Here's how they chained it. It was around configurations in Bitbucket. Um, so just a, a good example of how that feedback had a direct impact in the way that customers are using the product. The other thing that they do is they are looking at preventing new issues from upcoming feature releases. They are directly embedded with the product management team as they're shipping, they know what features are being shipped so they're trained and enabled. So that is also a key. If I can answer a question, it's just a confusion or it's a documentation, they're better informed, they're better at their job, they're also helping the customer support team. So there's a lot I can dive into this and I had to just kind of summarize it up, but it's a really key part of that continuous feedback loop that some I don't hear as many talking about today, there are IT ops and behind the scenes, but this is an important part of the business, and this has a direct impact on our business and the way we work. Now, another thing is kind of interesting behind the scenes that we're seeing this opt often happen, that is support bots. Many of you have different chat tools or capability, and it's the ability to take and automate efficiently answers that maybe your dev teams, your product teams have, and be able to allow them to look up, because these are common things. It's what the, this is a part of the DevOps drive within Alassian. An engineer says, we get this question a lot, or I want to ask about that. So, uh, for was this build successfully? Um, there's, we have put some of the fun ones in there. I think we have 50 to 60 different bots that are in uh, some of the hip chat rooms or dedicated rooms for them. And I know as an engineer, someone I can go and ask that question, and it's going to give me the answers. Now, an interesting one that we did was external. So customers could come to the website to ask a question, and someone could interact. But we knew that there was a need for, especially when there's a log file that's a lot for someone to parse through. So what, we, what the engineer said, let's parse it for them and kind of give them an answer because maybe that error code is answered over in a knowledge entry. And so what happened here is they shipped the Hercules bot and this was just an actual answer from customer. You may not be able to read it there. Um, his, his answer, he says, um, I, I, they took out the explicit, but uh, it was, uh, <laughs> he said, bleep me, uh, the robot was right. I increased my memory availability uh, on a Confluence Jira and things work today truly a magical day. Well, what they did, and Elastin is known for its t-shirts, we actually shipped the t-shirt for that customer and quite a few others that were using the bot. So it's, um, it's a great example where automation from a DevOps standpoint is now reaching to the customer side of that. Think about the, the impact that has for your customers to be able to deliver that type of service to them. And they've built on, there's many other examples out there. Uh, one that we've actually made available to customers is on this cu customer support site. So on our um, support at Atlassian.com, we get a lot of tickets inbound. Um, even customers are evaluating or allow, you know, they submit tickets. And so the support team decided to make this more efficient. We're going to build an automation plugin for our ticketing system that does 60 plus different roles. And what this does is support automation plugin, it'll look at, you know, what, where's the customer at? Do, maybe they have an expired license and they're trying to get their license renewed, they're, and it routes them to the proper team. It unfreezes you know, tickets after a certain amount of time, and it, it all range of this. But here's the amazing thing is the team said, this is so valuable, why do we keep it inside? They shipped it to our Elastian Marketplace and has over 2,000 downloads. So it's, it's about Elastian sharing innovation in that way. So you, when you think about the way your customer support teams work today, and maybe they're not on your radar today for being critical and key to the DevOps feedback. They are, and that's something you, I think you, you want to take a look at. And so that's the customer side of it. Um, there's other things with Lassie, like we have no phones. Um, we don't, I don't call anyone. Everything's driven through search, through online. I can submit. And I, I took that part out because it's really more a service management story. I wanted to focus on DevOps. And so I want to kind of bring it over to an IT operations team and hopefully give you a couple ideas Everyone's always looking to improve this aspect of lower mean time to resolution, be more efficient in the way that we um, solve these issues and get the service back up, and have a closer tie to those that are doing the long-term problem investigations. And it should be so closely joined. And so uh, expect the unexpected. How does our team do that? So 
you know, when we uh, ship a change uh, and also we're continuously uh, releasing, we actually have the continuous release model. And I didn't look at the numbers before um, I went through to write this. It's there are published uh, the, uh, per daily, but we are shipping to our production cloud product um, for Confluence, to Jira, Jira Service Desk, all those on a daily basis. And it's a pretty, and we, we want the engineers to do that. And we're, we've built an ecosystem that they've obviously moved up through to a point that's been tested. So we feel it's fairly safe, but we don't want to slow that process down because we want to drive innovation and deliver what customers want. But at the same time, you need a team in IT that's very closely aligned to that. And so that's where our SRE teams come in play in, play in this. And they've actually evolved. In the time that I've been there, there's been some realignment. And so what I want to share with you is how does our operations team approach a major outage? And we've had a couple of those with Confluence that I'll use in this one. There was a hip chat recently one. And these teams have evolved in the way that they're aligned. So I'm going to share some insights on that. But I think here's the part of this for these teams. Standardization is key. They follow ITIL, very lean approach in the way that they do is incident management, as well as long-term problem investigations. They also are um, aligned to fast response in the way that the teams operate. And then the last part of this that many IT teams really struggle is feedback. I, mean, I, I don't take a survey in here, but as I talk to customers, I always want to know, what is your post-incident review like today? How is it? Is it, is it mature? Is it, is it struggling? And so one thing I've really learned from our team is they've become very efficient on that because that is so key to the process. So the way our team works is that they have inbound from all of our cloud products, and there's an, there's an acronym for everything, right? Um, they actually are gra grabbing data from many different um, sources. And this, this has changed over time. Splunk's are now part of this, um, but it's the tools that are best fit for them to get the information they need, and then synthesize, synthesize that in a way that makes them effective in making their decisions. But here's the difference that I'll talk about in a few minutes they spend all of their time in the chat client. Because what it happens is, as things come in, and they're around the office, I've been in Sydney, there were eight, well, five floors, I think, or they're away from their desk, they're able to see those alerts. I'll talk about chat ops being so key to what they do. But once they do that and they have the notifications, they, they can act on those. Those become actionable insights that they know this is an issue, they know their environment. Also, the other thing that I don't have time to go into, but they've realigned to the actual products. They are embedded with the product teams that they're responsible to. Instead of being more centralized, they've now decentralized into these teams and they become more efficient. That was just a lesson learned over time. Once they know they have something, they create the incident ticket. That's when the SLA kicks off. So this is a little bit of a different approach, but for IT operations to be aligned to dev, they know when they've shipped last night. They can go look at their build and they know it was a successful build. So this approach is a very good fit for this team. They then can go ahead and de launch a dedicated hot room or chat ops room around this incident and swarm on that incident. Incident swarming is really key to where they work. And they're very competitive too. They want to become even better at the way that they respond. And I'll talk about before they implemented this and after what was the results in their incident response time. The other part of this is knowledge. Run books, uh, probably a lot of you have run books in different forms today. It's you know, process, you might automate them. For them, they put their run books for all their top services in Confluence. So if I'm an SRE engineer and I haven't touched that service, a microservice, in maybe 30 days, I haven't seen an incident, thankfully, in a while, I have a place to go and look at that, and I'll talk about how that plays in. And then, finally, the post-incident review. So I'll talk about that as well and go through how that plays into it. So as I said, chat ops is at the very heart of what they do. They've moved away from being in front of their systems, looking at their queues, to actually living within their um, chat client. And the one thing I love about going to Sydney is not the meetings I go there for, it's the, the side conversation, the time I spend with different teams. And I, at first I heard that, well, that's, you need an SLA, you, you gotta have that alert started. This team has become much more effective in this chat ops approach. And I was, I was skeptical of it from all my time in the, you know, the IT system industry. And it really is, I saw how they were doing this, I saw the effectiveness that came about because of it. So incident swarming is a part of what they do. But what do I mean by chat ops? Whatever chat client your team is using today, it's a way to put that chat client in the middle of the conversation, especially when there's a major outage and I have an outage that's impacting my customers, that's key. I can also leverage the team knowledge. One of them was talking about how he was at the store getting lunch when that something happened and he was able to respond 
and get information to the team saying, you need to check with this engineer because about this you know, being shipped. And it, they were able to connect in real time. And they, were, they do have an on-call. They have a mo manager that manages on-call. So it isn't just everyone swarming. They have dedicated teams and schedules. So there's a big schedule that goes behind us that the blog talks about that I don't go into here. They also collaborate in real time. We use HipChat internally, but I know teams use many different chat clients. At the end of the day, it's how do I leverage that chat client that they're currently using to make more efficient, they can lower that mean time to resolution. So for us, it's swarming around that incident. We actually launched a dedicated HipChat room. It's part of just integrated the product, but it's that now I can take that incident, the SLA is running, I want to bring in the key people that I know need to be there from the engineering side as well as IT. And so with the dedicated um, HipChat room, here, we're able to bring in the team and they can start to interact and solve this issue. We also audit all of that back into our, our incident. The teams customize the environment to fit their needs because there's a lot of data analytics that goes on. There's a lot of different add-ons. This is a this is not their environment. I, I couldn't show it here, but this is an example where a team's interacting, looking at it, looking at data. They brought data from Datadog. Um, all of you know, the cactus, of, of Splunk is now in there. They're able to see that data. Can I interrupt with a quick question? Sure. Does this all integrate into the ticketing system? Like yes. For, okay, so yeah. all this information is going to be documented. Yes. In the yes, it does. It audits. That's out of the box, and then they've made some adjustments for their team because it's an open API. Good, good question. No. So there's now a major incident ticket created for this. SLA is running. They have a whole matrix they can measure, measure the severity, severity impact for the microservice, if it's a major part of the service. So they have a way to do that that's set up that it's in the blog. I just don't have in here. And then what they do next, because I could be the engineer in the middle of the night that's touching this, because we ship code hopefully off hours, and then we, so now I'm gonna get the call. I don't know, I haven't touched the service. What do I need to check first? So we have run books that we've documented in Confluence that are reviewed on a regular basis. I can go and find that run book, and what they have found, their, their re resolution time has actually gone down, or it's improved, sorry, it's improved because of that engineer having that information. I gotta check this system, I gotta go here, before they even bring in the other engineers. This is really key. I've implemented a lot of run books that do this, this checks and that. It's one, just get the knowledge there. Whatever you have for that knowledge gathering place, Confluence is a great place because you can do it in a collaborative way, but take and centralize it. So that is at that fingertips of that team that they can find it. In theirs, they actually take and put a link of Confluence into that ticket because they know what it is. The other thing we communicate with stakeholders. How can you communicate with your external customers when that service goes down? If you don't have that means today, think about what you're seeing on Twitter or of those services that are being consumed. So what our team uses today, if you have an issue with HipChat or Confluence, you can go to status page and you can see what is that. This is behind the scenes. I can come in and create an in, a major incident um, ticket and I can start communicating with my external customers or internally, I ran it the other day, there was an issue with JIRA, I was trying to get into an instance. I knew where to go to check, was there an outage, is there scheduled maintenance? So it's both for internal and external, we have ability to communicate to the stakeholders. And in this case, we are using our own product status page to do that. For, for us and for our customers, they brand it. So it looks like a part of your ecosystem. You don't, you don't realize for the customer coming in, they think it's just I'm landing on um, that uh, your part of your site. So the communication is external here. It reduces the number of inbound issues and tickets to our front end team, our customer support teams. And this is a key part of incident response for major incidents for services that you have to get right today. Otherwise, it'll have a direct impact on your business. Okay, so they solve it, they get it back up, they roll back something. There's a lot that goes on there in the way the team collaborates. I think if I had to summarize one of the things, it's the collaboration the team is able to do and the tools they currently use. So how, it, with current tools you have today, are there ways that you can improve the way they collaborate? Is it the chat client? Is it something in current tool? Sharing in that information has direct impact, but it doesn't stop there. Here's the other part of this, is how do I learn from that outage? If I just you know, document, I put, a, I put a reason in there. I mean, I'm so, I was a Remedy consultant for years, and so we had, you know, we put the code in that, and someone wrote a report. But then someone's gotta go back and pull it out. They want to put it somewhere that the management teams can see it and those above. So internally, they'll create a record in JIRA and in Confluence, and they'll start to document, what did we learn from this outage? They roll that up to overall management team and reports to say, here's where we are in our KPIs. Here's where we can do better. This either will roll in over into a long-term problem investigation because we've seen this on a recurring basis. We've got to prevent it, 
or we've just got to get better and improve this aspect of our service. This is so key to the success of what this team has done. I, this is one of the learning points about all of my years in the industry that I found a team that had some great ideas and that's why we've shared it out there. Is way, how can you improve your post-incident review? Here's the, here's the data from, I believe it was last year. They went from 113 minutes down to 23 minutes in the meantime to diagnose. Now why is that? The way that the team collaborates in chat ops, the run books that they have at their fingertips to go and get to, and those run books are updated and reviewed on a regular basis, and just overall the insights, the data insights that they're able to infuse into the process. But I, if I had to pick any of them, it's probably the data sharing and the collaboration. That's at the heart of what they need to be successful. So, there's a lot more I could talk about here, but I wanna leave time for Q&A. And so what were the lessons learned from here, but also what we're hearing from other customers? Because um, how many have implemented DevOps in their organization? I mean, just kind of get a show. Okay, that's, that's pretty common, or you're starting there. So where do I start? First of all, your homework. And there are so many great resources from Gene Kim's book, The Phoenix Project. That's a great story in that way, and some of the publications out there. But there are many, um, the DevOps uh, forums that are uh, standing up that you can learn from other organizations. And that's one thing that Elastic is best in, and we're invested in sharing information that you can take away. And sometimes you don't have capability, you, your, your tool, current tools work, or you're adding other tools in. It's how can I apply these lessons today to my team? And that's what we want to be able to uh, do. The other thing is how can you invest in the culture of your team and improve it. Starts small, starts very, very small in the small sub subset. And then one team looks over and like, why are you guys operating that way and why have you improved? And then it starts to expand. So how can I invest in the culture and also around the way that they collaborate? How can I bring innovation into the team? Also, what are the needs of the organization looking up to the business? How can we better align to that? Are there initiatives right now that we can get into? And then w so there is some process review possibly. I've seen that within our teams where they've leaned up their change management process. They use peer reviews today for change their cap. There's still a, you know, some things being released into our data center. They have peer reviews. So when I'm a cab touching it, when they're touching it, they have all the data there. They've become much more of a virtualized and more effective. So what are the types of processes could be re improved and re reviewed? And obviously just start small and then go for the wins after that and build on that. More information. There is a just a wealth of knowledge. Elastium found that we were gathering a lot of this, and I we go to conferences and we'd speak. And I'm like, wow, it's, I'm learning a lot from your journey. Uh, this happened when I was at ITSMF conference in Australia last year in Brisbane. One customer had seen a year before how Elastium does something in this area, and we're sharing more information. So we knew that there was a there was a need and a hunger for this. So we created a microsite. It's called IT, IT Plug. You can go there, download, watch wherever you want, and it's a way that we share. IT knowledge with the organization. There's also a DevOps one that's um, launched or getting an update, I think, in the near future. It is available today. But for IT, and there's a mix of DevOps and IT and service management here. Take a look at this, visit it, um, interact with those, let us know what you feel, how you th think of those, if there's something value or something you're looking more for. And the other thing is, uh, a lot of teams I find small will just take some of the products, start using them within their team. HipChat's free for teams to use. Status page, uh, be able to stand it up internally and use it or externally. Uh, Jira Service Desk, some smaller IT operations teams are using it, and yet they have other ITSM tools and they, they coexist. So there's a lot of different approaches on that. But my whole goal is hopefully you've got an insight that you want to go look at that you can apply today with your teams that you can learn from. That's, that's my goal, and hopefully there's something of value there. So with that, I left a little bit of time here for Hopefully I didn't go too fast. I had five cups of coffee. I tried to cut back. <laughs> <laughs> what questions do we have? Any? Yes. Hey, uh, your IT operations team, does it also service like your internal systems as well as your hosted? Yes. Or is that a separate group? No, it's in, there is a team that does internal systems. And that one I'm talking about is the, all of the microservices that make up Confluence right, or right. HipChat. We have teams that work on internal systems as and well. So they're separate teams? Yes. Yeah. Um, and the one lesson they learn is they weren't by being more centralized they decentralized and they're much more effective because they are closer to what what's in the what's in the sprint for the dev team what are they shipping they know where to go at the releases and that was a change that happened in that they didn't have it was over a year ago i believe that nick wright nick wright our, uh, he's the lead of that team out of sydney he wrote a great blog on that so great insights but good question thank you and did you 
Yeah, is, is, is your hosting operations team then, um, is it underneath engineering or is it an entirely separate division? No, they're underneath engineering. Okay. They, work, they work close with engineering, okay. yeah. Other question, I'll go to the back and I'll work my way across. Yes. Comments instead of questions. Um, one is your excitement for what you're doing and what you're bringing comes through. Thank Great you. Great job. It really comes through. Uh, the second thing is, is that just a kudos kind of to it last year. A lot of times you get tools and, you know, you're thrown into go use this tool and there's very little instruction. At last year, uh, I was told to go use Confluence. I've never used it before and I was able to set up pages and, you know, go to those macros and expand lists and everything because everything is so well documented. So just a general oh, thank you. Thank you, you for that. The tool. For somebody who never used it, I was able to oh, be thank you. And... you know, it's I get to stand up here and talk about it. There are so many amazing teams. I, I just can't sh speak that about enough that are working so hard around the globe on the product. And it just makes it easy to stand up here and talk about when there's such innovation. By the way, before you leave, I do one, I'll take more questions. We have t-shirts in the back. These It's called uh, Build a New Shape of IT. If you want to pick one up uh, from the team going out, kind of a fun. My niece and nephew thought that we were a, 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 a t-shirt company. They didn't know the last time built software. So it's fun to They have cool t-shirts, but we also um, we have, that way. So. We have a dedicated uh, SharePoint team. Okay. I can do more with the last in the suite with no experience. Than oh, well, that's awesome. I'd love to so chat with you. Okay. And we have some more Confluence team here, so maybe stop by the booth and meet with them, they'd love to hear. Um, okay, I'm gonna work my way across. I think I saw a question here and then I'll work my way back. Yeah, yes. just a quick question. You had a dashboard posted a few slides back with yes. an outage, like you yes. advertise the outage. Is that manually maintained or is it linked to the system where it gets automatically fed when there's a system outage? Yeah, so what this team has done, they use Confluence, they feed the data in. There's a lot going on with the REST API that they're feeding the data in. Some of that's actually talked about in one of the webinars. Um, but they fed that in. They found Confluence was a good way to do it. They do have some other dashboards, uh, but they want that to be consumable by different parts of the organization as they make decisions. Okay. Yeah. Get with me afterwards, and maybe we can talk a little more about it. Yeah. Uh, next question. Um, you mentioned continuous release models and shipping on a daily basis, and I was yes. curious to know more about the success factors, the risk, the integration between platforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm going to see if I can find the resource to share with you afterwards. It is a model that we have evolved to because we've learned there's been outages directly from something that they did the test over here and they shipped and they, they had an issue. But now the way our infrastructure and microservices is set together, put up that they can ship with a very minimal, they've worked to minimize the risk in the way that automation testing is there and they are shipping to production systems on a, on a regular basis. <laughs> The number we ship and the infrastructure in that, I don't know how much we've published externally, um, but. Yeah, is if there's any kind of, you know, kind of that journey okay. to grow into that, that's really Yeah, where one of our, t I'll, so come see me afterwards, I'll give you an email, okay. and I'll send you a link where I know that one of our Alaskan teams talk, spoke at our summit. Our Alaskan summit's great because we share a lot of insights, and I think they talked about that, I can find that one for you. Okay. Yeah. You. Other question, I'm gonna go to the other side of the room, I'll go to the back and then come to the front, yes sir. Yes. Right. How do you manage the change? Right? Like, you know, if you're doing too many releases, like, you know, frequently, when you say release one, release cuts it down. And, like, I mean, if, I'm, if I'm a customer, like, and I'm seeing frequent changes, how can I adapt to it? Like, you know, how do you handle that? Good question. So, as far as release goes, it could be a feature around a certain product. So, for, for recently in Service Desk, they shipped KB reports and one other thing I was reading through. And so, there's a, the release notes are there. So, that that's feature set is released. Uh, they actually will know, they'll test on certain customers, they'll, they'll have visibility to it. Um, it just kind of becomes seamless, and they also send out notifications of the releases, so customers can tune in and know, hey, something shipped, here's the feature, so our product documentation, uh, cloud product documentation team is really good around that, and that way they stay in tune with what's happening in features. Is that on, on, on like, you know, but we don't get updates Yep, so yeah. There's a way that they can subscribe to it. It's it's a summary that goes out to them in an email. That's probably how most get it. Server is so we don't. Our server team follows cloud in some ways, and so those are you know uh, behind that. But we, they do ship on a fairly regular basis 
you know, uh, throughout the year. I don't remember what, what our record was last year, like four, I think, on some server products. So that's the best way for them to stay in tune. The other thing is through the website and support, um, there's some information there as well. And I come by in the booth and we'll uh, find you a better answer on that and we can uh, connect to that. I'll take a question up front. One quick question. So you mentioned you do, you do uh, testing automation tools. Mm -hmm. what, what do you use? Good question. Oh, there's a full bench of them. I can send you an email of some of the ones I know. I don't off the, off the top of my head because I live in the IT space and interact with them. I can find some of those and get you that answer. So, I'll send you an email. Thank yep. You. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. I'm around, so uh, please come by uh, the booth. Come up here. Glad to chat. We'll be at the booth later on if you want to talk to more of the team. The rest of the team is there. So I thank you all for uh, t spending time with me over your lunch hour. Thanks.